Hello, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, we're going to do another study, Attacks When Defending the Word of God when it comes to Christmas, um, one day. One attack you're going to get when you try to call out sin for what it is, sin. All sin is negative. Um, you're going to get this attack back one day, and we're going to get into it. Before we get started, there's a couple of things I'd like to mention. People might ask, why am I wearing the hat? My pellet stove died on me. <laughs> I've been trying to get things fixed on it. It's an old pellet stove. It might be as old as this house is. This house is very old. Um, so the pellet stove died on me, and I used to run the pellet stove for a couple hours in the morning and a couple hours in the evening, and it would really heat this house up. And this house was built really nice, praise the Lord, to hold the heat in during the uh, winter and to hold the coolness in at, during the summer, because I'd open up all the windows during the summer, a window, all the windows, if I can say it right, during the summer, and I'd close at night, and I'd close them during the day, and keep this place pretty cool, clear to the evenings. Okay. So I didn't have to run AC, which I really don't have much of an AC unit to begin with, and I don't run the electric heater. Well, the pellet stove finally died on me. It's not working anymore. So um, I've got a couple heaters that I'm running to keep this house clean. The Lord blessed me with being able to get another heater to bring in that will help heat, uh, heat 1,000 square feet, and we'll see how that goes. And Maybe this summer, if we're still here, and a lot of the bad things that we're all looking at what's going on in the world, if the bad things get put off even further, I might be able to get it fixed by this summer. Um, so that answers that part. The other thing I wanted to mention real quick, Brother Sister of Christ, is this. Make sure you have your King James Bibles out, and this is your final authority. And God put it on my heart to let you know that when I got saved, one of the things I was taught was is that when this becomes your final authority in all matters of faith and practice and leads you into the changed life after salvation, God goes around and tells you, do this, don't do this. This you, this you want near you, that stuff stay away from. And eventually over time, when you start life starts changing and you start living for the Lord, um, it's going to cost you relationships with people. It's going to cost you friends, your lost friends. It's going to cost you your lost family members. It could cost physical things, like it could cost you your job. It could cost you, like with me, there's some places I can't go. When you go to town and stuff like that, there's times I go to the beach and say, hey, I want to walk on the beach. I have my cue cards, my memory verses, and I've got my gospel tracks, and I'm sitting there, and I'm looking for sea glass and agates and I'm talking with the Lord and everything and praying and it seems great, right? But there's sometimes I go to the beach and I look on the beach before I go down there and there's just, there's certain beaches I can't go to over here on the coast. There, I have to go to back beaches in the backwoods. But there's certain beaches, you sit there and you look, people are blaring satanic style music and modestly dressed men and women and there might be alcohol, so they have a bonfire, and people are just drinking it up and everything. And it's like, it's one thing if I'm standing back and having a sign and handing gospel tracts as people are going to the beach. It's another thing for me to go on that beach and start having all that sin and wickedness around me. Okay, that's the point I'm making. I've had to make some sacrifices. You're going to lose some things as you stand for the Word of God and say, I don't want anything to do with that. Okay, you don't go to the bars anymore if you used to go to the bars before you got saved. You don't do this, you don't do that. But it's going to cost you some things after salvation. Your life's going to change. And I was taught that the big thing you're going to lose is a lot of relationships. You're going to lose a lot of friends, family. You could lose your job. Uh, the way the lost world used to look at you when you were one of us. Hey man, how's it going brother? Now that you're saved, they look at you like you're, you're diseased. You're mentally ill. Yeah. But one thing I was never really taught, Brother Sister Christ, as going into it, as a Christian, and I had to learn sometimes the hard way, is that standing for absolute truth in worst, 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 worst case scenarios can cost you fellowship with the brethren, with a brother in Christ, not brethren as a whole. If it's brethren as a whole, then maybe you're the one with the problem. But with brethren... Okay, and I said that last, last, last resort because the Bible has steps on how we're supposed to rec uh, go to a brother in Christ and correct him. 
go to him with some witnesses and correct him. The whole church goes to him and corrects him. Then he's to be as a heathen man and a publican. Then you break fellowship with him. But today it just seems like the brethren, and I struggle with it sometimes too, uh, we become cowards, and instead of dealing with that person face to face, we just go straight to the last step and we just cut him off. Just cut him off. Just cut him off. And we're not supposed to do that. But back to the study. I understand the study might cause more people to go and run the other way. But brothers and sisters in Christ, it's chapter and verse. I got into talking with uh, someone, a professing brother in Christ, in one of the comment sections, and no matter how much, in that last study we did on liberty, one of the attacks you'll get when you stand for the Word of God is that we have liberty, and they're misusing liberty. Okay. And they're misusing liberty as how they're trying to use it, and, there are, and when it falls under liberty when it comes to sin, and they're trying to use liberty as an occasion to the flesh. But we went back and forth, and all I kept doing was saying, where's the scriptures in the scriptures? Where's the scripture? There? Chapter and verse on where you think I was wrong in that study, in that video. I'll talk with you. Show me where I'm wrong in the scriptures. All he could do was attack me personally. That's all he could do. He refused to talk with me with the scriptures. This is going to cause me to lose some friends. <laughs> okay? Some brethren. Okay? Whether they be false or true, they saved. I'm probably going to lose some people. Why? Because I say chapter and verse. This is my final authority. And, it was supposed, and, and some of you, this was your final authority. And what Satan's doing is he's taking this book away from you. And you start falling into the world. And you forget to have this as your final authority. It's thus saith the Lord, not thus saith my preferences. Not thus saith my feelings and opinions. Not my deepest dark desire to go back to socialism. I miss all the social fun, the social gatherings, the social atmosphere. Uh, being saved, especially in these last days, means isolation. It means you're going to be alone. Okay. For the most part. It's hard in these last days. So one of the attacks they'll give you when you actually do say chapter and verse, let's get to the study, when he actually says chapter and verse is Romans 14, 5. One man esteemeth one day above another, one man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be persuaded in his own mind. See, that justifies Christmas. Now you get away from me and stay away from me. You anti-Christmas person, stay away from me. It's like, okay. This is how I respond to that, brothers and sisters of Christ. They, 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 they're, they're, it's almost like they're trying to meet us halfway. They're quoting scripture. That's good. That's a start. It's, 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 it's open door. But you ask him, that one day that the man in Romans 14, 5, that's esteeming above another, that one day, if you can read it, is it saying that it's any day? And if they're confused, well, I don't understand what you're talking about. I'm asking, could that one day be any day out there? Well, it kind of sounds like it when you say one day above another. One man esteemeth one day above another. Well, then you hit them up, and I'd ask them these questions. I put out the Bible study that Brother Brian did, because I couldn't have done a better, a better study on it. Brian did an amazing study on Halloween. Okay? He shows how evil and wicked it is. He shows there might be some open doors to witness for Jesus Christ, hand out gospel tracts. But as a whole, you're not to have anything to do with Christmas. It's pagan. It's satanic. It's wicked. He even uh, basically gets onto the Babel building system that tries to Christianize it. Oh, we can find a righteous way to do it because we, the battle building people, they're the final authority. This isn't the final authority. So yeah, sometimes I'd ask myself, why are people acting like, like the battle building? We have all these professing, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women around us, and some of them are acting like the battle building people. They're the final authority. But you ask them about Halloween. Is it okay for a Christian because some of you might not have known about Halloween, that's why I put that say out. How many, you ask them, is Christmas okay for a Bible-believing Christian? Is it something a Christian celebrates and observes? Halloween. Well, hopefully, brothers and sisters, you'll say no, because that's the right answer. No. 
A Christian will have nothing to do with Halloween. It's pagan. It's satanic. Brian did uh, all the, pra the practices that go along with Halloween. He did a, a, a historical study to tell you law of first mention, where they came from and everything. It's wicked. It's evil. Let's hit you another one. What about Easter? I'm looking over at this Andy day because this is how they're treating this one day above another. That it's any day. So then you hit them up and say, what about Easter? Well, what is Easter? Easter is false god worship where they, they, they put all these false gods. When you look at all these holidays, there's false gods behind these holidays. And how do you get mankind to worship these false gods? You don't whip them. You don't make it as miserable as, po miserable as possible by putting the flesh down. I wrote it down here, elevating the spirit, elevating the flesh. You don't do it by putting the flesh down. You do it by elevating the flesh. With Halloween, how do you get people? Oh, you get to dress up as whoever you want to, and you get all this candy, and you get to put up all these decorations, and all it's all flesh, 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 flesh. It appeals to the flesh. And, uh, and then, like I said, and then behind the scenes, the true meaning behind Halloween, which Brian talked about in that study, it's a wickedness. That's what you're supporting. That's what you're worshiping. It's the wickedness that's behind it all. Uh, Easter, it's the worship of false gods through fornication. Oh, yeah. All right. It's wicked. It's pagan. Brother Brian has talked about it. I keep bringing up Brother Brian because everybody thinks it's me against Brother Brian. It's not. It's what saith the scriptures. But even by Brian's own mouth, he's, he doesn't have an actual, I wish he did, he doesn't have an actual study on Easter and how wicked it is. It's just in other studies Easter comes up and he'll talk about it. Okay? Easter, because people are, are coming over here and they're saying, I'm a Brian. I'm a Philip. I'm a Brian. No, don't defend me. Don't defend Brother Brian. He would agree to this. I pray he still would agree with this. You defend the Word of God. It's not thus say Philip Newton. It's not thus say Brother Brian. It's not thus say uh, Jacob Thomas, Brother Jacob Thomas. Not, it's not thus saith, you know, Brother Brad Abenshine, whoever. It's thus saith the Lord. This is what you're supposed to defend. The Word of God. And people are getting away from doing that. And becoming a respecter of persons. I'm on his side, I'm on that side. But even Brother Brian will admit that Halloween, by his own words, Halloween is evil and wicked. Easter is evil and wicked. And I would go as far as if you really, if you're fighting someone that's really being stubborn, I would go as far as to ask him, well then, because Easter is a holiday, and they try to say holidays and holy days are the same thing, so they both apply to one day. So they're turning one day into any day. When you say holy day, holidays and holy days are the same thing, then you're turning one day into any day. So then we ask, what about Halloween? Oh, no, no, you can't celebrate Halloween. But it's a holiday. And by default, a holy day to some people. But uh, no. Easter, it's a holiday. But by default, is it a holy day? No. Christian, you're not supposed to do it. So if you get someone that's really stubborn, you hit them up and just go straight for it and say, hey, what about Pride Day? Oh, we know pride is a sin. No, it's actually Sodomite Day. They're prideful in their sin of sodomy. It's a national holiday now. It's now a holiday. Is it okay for a Christian? The Bible says sodomy is an abomination in the sight of God. It's an abomination in my sight. It's supposed to be an abomination in your sight. So the obvious answer is no. So once you get, break them down and you get them to admit that the one day that the Bible's talking about in verse 5, the one day above another day is not any day. It's not any day. And you get them there, there might be hope for them. Okay? So if one day above another is not any day, how can we figure out what that one day is? I remember 33rd book, I love his channel, he's always like, well, we'll go to the Greek lexicon, the Texas Receptus, 
the dead language of Greek. No, 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 we'll just keep reading the Bible. The Bible clears itself up. Amen on that. I haven't heard from 33rd book in a while. As far as videos, putting out videos and stuff. But if you want to know what that one day is in Romans 14, 5, why don't we just keep reading? Let's read Romans 14, 6. He that regardeth the day, the one day above another, he that regardeth the day, he regardeth it unto the Lord. Let's stop there for a second. I don't know how else to say this, brothers and sisters Christ. My response when I did, did that, someone brings up Romans 14.5, Romans 14.5, one man steameth the day, one day above another, one man steameth the day alike, let every man be persuaded in his own mind. And I type in there, okay, why didn't you finish reading and read verse 6? And I got yelled at for that. All I said was, is why didn't you read verse 6? Something's not right. Something's wrong with, with, with some of the brethren out there when they're arguing over us saying chapter and verse. Or saying, hey, why didn't you read verse 6? He could have read verse 6 and said, oh, I left it out, but I really meant it, and I understand what... He could have said all kinds of things. But coming back angry, bitter, mad, all because I just said, what about verse 6? He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now we know what that one day is. The one day above another that one man's keeping, and the one day that, it's not this word, but the one day that the man is treating every day alike, the one day here is a day that's unto the Lord. The Bible defend, de describes and defines itself. Let's keep reading. And he that regardeth not the day, to the Lord he doth not regard it. Once again, it's not any day. It's one day, and it's unto the Lord. He that eateth, because some, some of the verse, chapter 4, is talking about people are being judged, their salvation is being judged because they won't eat meat. Okay, it's saying they can't get saved if they don't observe the holy days, eating the meat in the holy days. Um, they're being judged. The holy days and the Sabbath days and the new moon. And giveth God thanks. For he that giveth, let's see, let's start with, he that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, eateth not, and giveth God thanks. For none of us live to, liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. For whether we live, we live unto the Lord, and whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. Verse 9. For to this end Christ both died and rose and revived, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. Paul, why are you bringing salvation into this if this is just one of those we can agree to disagree and it's a choice thing you can just choose to? Why is he bringing salvation into it? Because what's going on here is we keep reading, people are coming in saying, if you don't keep these days, you can't get saved or you can lose your salvation. If you are saved, you'll lose your salvation. That's what they're saying here. That's why Paul had to bring the death of Jesus Christ back into it. It is finished. But brothers and sisters in Christ, who is being judged here? When you read everything that I just read there, who's being judged here? The one man that esteemeth one day above another, is he the one being judged? No. Who's being judged here? The man that is that uh, one man esteemeth one day above another, the one man esteemeth every day alike. The man that's esteeming every day alike, he's the one being judged. How did it get turned around where when we call out Christmas as sin, they're trying to grab this and it's making it out like we're judging them for the one day? And it's not. This whole thing, when you read the passage, people are coming in and telling them, if you don't keep the one day, that we're saying is unto the Lord, you know, that mankind is saying, the doctrines and commandments of men, I'm getting ahead of myself, if you don't keep the one day, you can't be saved. If you don't keep the ordinances, if you don't get circumcised, you can't be saved. That's what's going on here. Who's being judged here? The man that's, that's not keeping the day. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. 
So if someone's keeping a day and it's unto the Lord and it's a good thing, they're not the ones being judged. Who's being judged? The one not keeping the day. That's very important with this. When we call out sin and say, hey, what you're doing there, Christmas, it's the commandments of men. It's the traditions of men. It's the doctrines of men. It has, nothing to, it has no biblical stands to, grounds to stand on. If Christmas was put on trial for being Christian, would it be found guilty? No. It wouldn't. I could do a whole study on it, showing all the lies, fairy tales, falsehoods that don't line up with the Scriptures when it comes to Christmas. Nope, you're not Christian. You're worldly. Sorry. You're innocent. You're not a Christian thing. Remember that whole saying we should say about a Christian? If you're put on trial for being a Christian, there should be enough evidence to convict you. If Christmas is Christian, there should be enough evidence to convict it. There's not. Nothing. Now, days in the New Testament. Remember, this is being told to Gentiles. And we're going to talk about what's going on, because they don't want to talk about the context of Romans 14.5. They don't want to talk about the context by comparing Scripture with Scripture to find out what's going on here. Remember, this is me, and you can disagree with me on this, but I believe the end of Acts to most of all of Romans is an overview of Paul's test of his life, his ministry. Everything that you see in Romans, you can find it in the Pauline epistles where he's writing to the churches. If he did an expository... If someone would finish their expository studies, they started on the Pauline epistles. Nudge, nudge. Uh, some of you know who I'm nudging. I'm not being mean about it. I would love to see him do it, uh, the brother of Christ. Um, when you're doing Romans expository study, you're going to be going all over the Pauline epistles, the letters he's writing to the churches, because that's what's going on. So when you compare this scripture to other uh, books in the Bible, the Pauline epistles, where is other scriptures where there's a day where people are trying to tell them you've got to do this in order to be saved? If you don't do this, you can't get saved. Where else is that going on in scripture? You compare scripture with scripture. But before we do that, let me ask you. He's writing to, to Gentiles. And he's writing to Christians today. Where in the New Testament do we have days, one day, above another? Can you show it to me? We look for that blessed hope. We look for that day that there's going to be a catching away of the body of Christ. We look forward to that day. But it's not a yearly thing where we've got a, we have a catching away of the body of Christ day. And we're doing it one day above another. And we're doing it unto the Lord. And we're doing it every year. No, it isn't. It's just something we're looking for. But hopefully this really, hopefully this, this really sets in. I did another study on it. Just a quick talk on the hillside. I added it in the link below the Halloween one when I was talking about Halloween. And I want to kind of go over some of those verses again. Days in the New Testament. Are we supposed to have one day above another as a New Testament Christian? Are we? Turn to Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Luke 9, 23. Remember, you can always pause the video, turn, and unpause. Pause, turn, unpause. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Is that a one day above another? No. We're told to pick up our cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. What's going on there? You can read the whole context. Paul is correcting the Corinthians. They're so fleshly, like they're carnally minded, walking after the flesh, to the point where Paul even doubts their salvation. Not all of them, but some of their salvations. If a man be called a brother. He tells them that 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4, talks about how you can believe in vain. And if you want the perfect store example of how to believe in vain, uh, believe in vain, read about Simon the sorcerer. <laughs> you know, Philip goes and preaches the gospel. People believe, but.
but nobody has the Holy Spirit. Paul and them come in, lay their hands on those that believe, and they receive the Holy Ghost. And then Simon didn't receive the Holy Ghost. He believes, and he's sitting there, he's saying, Oh, I'll give you all this money if you can teach me how to do that. Give me that power so I can be witch go back to bewitching the people. And Paul tells him, you have no part in this. In other words, you're not saved. But the Bible says he believed. Okay? Don't want to start going off on another study, but so there you have the easy believism fighting you. Oh, it's only belief. It's only belief. All things are possible if you only believe. Tell that to Simon the sorcerer. He'll tell you you're full of it. I believed. And I was still lost. And he was. But you have him telling him that. And he says, I die daily. We're supposed to be putting this body of flesh down daily. The Bible says put on the whole armor of God. And I uh, we'll get back to that study eventually. But it's something you do daily. You put on the whole armor of God every day. And you put the flesh down every day. The life of a Christian is a day-to-day -day thing. One of my favorite hymns is Day by Day. Day by day, and with each passing moment, strength I find to meet my trials here. Yeah, it's a day-by-day -day thing. It's not a one day above another for a Christian today. It's a day-by-day -day thing. You want to doubt me? Let's go through some more scripture then. Hebrews chapter 3.13. Now understand Hebrews, written to the Jews in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's going to be some things that overlap in Hebrews and the Pauline epistles because half of the gospel is there. The gospel we have today, minus the sealed unto the day of redemption, is there in the time of Jacob's trouble. You still have to repent, believe, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. But you're not sealed into the day of redemption. You have to endure to the end to be saved. Don't take that mark and don't worship that beast. Okay? But there's things that sound like, oh, Hebrews is for today. That's because some of it overlaps. But overall, I tell people, Hebrews is for the time of Jacob's trouble. But look what's going on here. Hebrews 3.13 But exhort one another daily. Encourage the brethren every day. Stand your ground. Don't take that mark for the time of Jacob's trouble. Don't take that mark. It's not worth it. Don't worship the beast. Come on, you can do it. We're getting there. It's only been a year. We, I know it seems like we got a long way. It's been six years. We're almost there. Don't take it. Okay? Exhort one another daily why it is called today. I love that. Remember that saying about don't put off tomorrow what you can do today? Remember the Bible talks about how salvation, now is the time of salvation, today. Don't put off tomorrow what you can do today. Now is the time to get saved. You don't wait for things to fall apart. You don't wait until the after the catch and weigh the body of Christ to get saved. You want to get saved today. But this here context is talking about exhorting one another daily while it's called today. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. How do we apply that today? Instruction righteous. We're supposed to be encouraging the brethren. Stay away from sin. Stay away from sin. I get prayers from the brethren and encouragement from the brethren. Stay away from those because I confess, I confess my faults. Everybody's faults might be the same. Some might overlap. Some might be different. Everyone has their own addictions and uh, sins that God really had to wrestle to get out of their lives, and it's something that they're going to struggle with the temptation until the day they die. And you have brethren that will exhort one another, encouraging you, stand for the Word of God, stay in the Word of God, stay in prayer, don't stay away from that pagan holiday, stay away from those video games, their addictions, their wicked. Most times, almost all the time, every game, that even someone said Tetris once. If you actually look at where Tetris, Tetris comes from, it's designed to be uh, addicting. It's a whole mind experiment game that they came out with, and they decided to put it out there like it's just some innocent game. Uh, no, it's dangerous. Stay away from the games. But the point is, is we encourage each other to stay on the path. We encourage each other to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ. The, why? Through the, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sins. A brother or sister in Christ 
their heart can start to harden because they start giving in to sin and they put this book down. And I've talked to them. It's called the falling away. The Bible talks about the falling away. Some of them, their heart's getting so hard that you try talking to them and there's just no reaching them. They've gone back to the way of the world. God will deal with them at this point. God will take his hammer of um, you know, discipline um, and he'll break that heart, the, the hardness of the heart off. In other words, he'll break us and crumble us to pieces and then he'll pick us back up and put us back together chastisement of the Lord. Sorry. The chastisement of the Lord. God will have to deal with them. But that's there. You say, well, that's, that's Hebrews. You said it's only for the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, 2 Timothy 4.2. What does 2 Timothy 4.2 say? It says, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all longsuffering. Yeah, we're going to have to exhort every day. It's longsuffering. And doctrine. So when I'm exhorting you, telling you to stay away from those sins, continue reading your Bible, pray without ceasing, we use the Word of God. You encourage the brethren with the Word of God. Not feelings and opinions. Not let me pat you on the back. It's with the Word of God. Well done, well done thou good and faithful one. All right? We talk, about, we talk about the judgment seat of Christ. We talk about, you know, rewards. Serving our Savior. Okay. But we see there, it's every day. There, once again, the life of a Christian is every day. Acts, a lot, when you're doing, I'm talking about the unto the Lord. We read about unto the Lord. For us as Christians, every day is a day unto the Lord. There is no one day above another. Every day is unto the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 Pray without ceasing. And the Bible talks about it. Why do we pray? To make requests. Let your requests be made known unto God. Uh, 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 prayers for the brethren. Paul saw about my prayer for you. I'm praying for you. Amen. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men and abradeth not, gives to all men liberally and abradeth not. You want wisdom? You pray. That's what asking God is. You pray. That's what prayer is. You're talking to the Lord. You're going to pray without ceasing. That's every day. I didn't mention it before, but one of these big things is National Prayer Day. I had a brother in Christ bring that up and talk about it in a video. A national Prayer Day. It's, it's wicked. Stay away from that. There's not supposed to be a one day above another when it comes to prayer. You're supposed to pray every day. You're supposed to hold prayer as an important part of your life every day. Turn to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17, verse 10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Silas by night unto Berea. It's called the Bereans. What did the Bereans do? They searched the scriptures night and day to see if those things were so. Are we supposed to have one day above another? When it comes to reading the scriptures and applying them to your heart, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee? No, that's an everyday thing. You need to be in this book every day. The moment you put this book down, the lost world comes in and says, Hey, these holidays, oh, there's nothing wrong with these holidays. Oh, that sin you're doing over there, oh, there's nothing wrong with those sins. Oh, this, it's, it's not a big deal. Hey, you want to be part of a social group? C come back to the Babel buildings, come on. When you put this down, they search the scriptures daily. The life of a Christian, this is the point I'm trying to push, brothers and sisters of Christ. I'm not doing this to be mean. I'm not trying to, we're going to just put a burden on you that even our fathers weren't able to bear. No, this is the life of a Christian, and the stuff that I'm telling you here, it's a day to day life, it's what gets you through life as a Christian. It keeps you from falling away and being part of the falling away. It helps keep you from sin. 
It keeps you pleasing God, elevating the spirit and pleasing God, and not elevating your flesh and pleasing your flesh. Okay. There's, a bio, there's, there's another song out there that I love. It's called, I Serve a Risen Savior. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever men may say. I hear, I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, He lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. We have a personal relationship with a risen Savior that lives. Okay? I don't have a personal relationship with somebody if I only have one day above another. I only have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ once or twice a year. It's every day. And the big reason I also sung that is because we serve a risen Savior. Okay? We worship Jesus, glorified, risen, who's in heaven right now, preparing a place for you and for me. If you're saved, you and me. That's the Jesus we worship. Okay? Not a dead man. Because a lot of people like to say, well, he's dead and buried. He was just a prophet. We don't worship and serve a dead man. And we sure don't worship and, ce and celebrate an, uh, a baby and a manger. We worship a risen Savior. Okay, You sing to a risen Savior. I serve a risen Savior. And all of a sudden people get upset at me. I don't worship a baby Jesus. Then give it up. I ain't giving it up. Then you worship a baby Jesus. Okay. Days in the Old Testament. Because like I said, chapter and verse, that's what my thing is. I don't worship a baby Jesus. Chapter and verse on Christmas. Where's the command? Where's the doctrine on Christmas? That the birth of Jesus Christ is supposed to be blown so out of proportion that we're worshiping a baby Jesus instead of a risen Savior that's being turned into a pagan, it's being used to disguise, not turned into, that the birth of Jesus Christ is using to disguise a pagan holiday. It's not there. But as you see, the one day above another for a Christian, every day is unto the Lord. Our whole life is unto the Lord. And you say, well, it says above another. Every day we're supposed to be living for the Lord. Okay? Who has the one day above another? Well, days in the Old Testament. You know if you follow this ministry, you know that I preach that Romans 14, when you start comparing it to what's going on in, uh, we're going to read a little bit in Corinthians, uh, it's going on in Galatians, Galatians um, Colossians chapter 2, the Jews are coming in and messing up the Gentiles and saying, you've got to keep these holy days, Sabbath days, new moon, and these ordinances in order to be saved. If you don't keep them, you're not saved. And if you refuse to keep them, you can't get saved. You lost your salvation. If you failed to keep them this year, you, you, you lost your salvation. That's what's going on here in Romans 14. We've already discussed it. It's not any day. And if it's not any day, who determines what day is one day above another? Certainly not you, and certainly not me. So that's why we say chapter and verse. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. For this Christ, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdoms of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Oh, you, yeah, you gotta, you got to repent, you got to believe, you know, confess both in prayer, ask God to save you. Yes, that's good, that's good. But you also got to keep this one day here above another in order to be saved. Words of wisdom. Lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. When you start adding anything to the true plan of salvation that God has set up, you make that salvation of none effect. What Jesus did on the cross, pointless. 
if you think you can earn your way to heaven. There's people who think they can earn it with their faith, the faith alone crowd, and you think there's people that can earn it with their works. No, you can't earn it. Verse 18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. The faith alone crowd, the true plan of salvation, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you, it's foolishness to them. To the people who believe that they can earn their way to heaven, it's foolishness to them. But unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Look at my life, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm a living testimony of the power of God. The changed life that comes after salvation. When God comes into your life and now He's your capital K King. A King gives orders, you obey. Capital L Lord of Lords. When a Lord gives an order, you obey. Power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and I'll bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. The wisdom of the wise. Why are we even fighting this? Because we got people coming in with the wisdom of the wise and bringing nothing to understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. That's what that one day above another is. It's a sign for the Jewish people. The Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. All the days, like the Greeks, the days that we have that are one day above another, they're not unto the Lord. We're, we're like back, going back to Adam and Eve. Uh, ye can be as gods, knowing good and evil. We're seeking wisdom and trying to get more light, more light, and we're trying to become gods ourselves so we can be worshipped as gods someday. That's the Gentiles. The Jews, they have a capital G God that they believe in, but in order to stay faithful to that man, they need signs. The one day above another. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Because you're just preaching it. Well, where's the evidence? You've got to have faith. Oh, we want to see a sign. We want one day above another. We need a sign. Then I'll believe. It's a stumbling block. And unto the Greeks, foolishness. You mean I can't earn my own salvation? You're telling me I can't become God someday? Everything you said, it just sounds like fairy tales. It just sounds like a fable. But, when the Jew drops his self-righteousness and pride, when the uh, Gentile drops his self-righteousness and pride, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. So why did you read that? Because the Jews require a sign. But our sisters of Christ, this is what it always comes down to. They'll grab something, when you try to point out their sin, they grab something that's based off salvation being judged. I'm not judging their salvation. They're bringing their own salvation into question. Because they grab something from the Bible that's talking about salvation. Why are you judging them to lose their salvation or telling them that they can't get saved because they're not circumcised? I'm getting ahead of myself. That's what's going on here. It has nothing to do with us calling out sin for what it is. Sin. Whether it be Christmas, whether it be getting drunk, whether it be you're fornicating, whether it be what, cussing, whatever. We're calling out your sin. You know what the easy believism people do when you call out their sin? Are you saying I'm lost? I, I'm not saved by works. You're saying I'm trying to, I have to be saved by works. I'm not saved by works. That's how the lost false converts react. So why do we have brethren reacting the same way? Why do we have brethren reacting the same way? When you're getting called out on sin, you need to actually check yourself and make sure that you line up with the Scriptures. The one day here is not any day. The one day here is not holidays. The one day here, the only other thing it can be is holy days, because that's in the Scriptures. Okay, the wisdom of words. Romans 6, 18, you don't have to turn here, but it says, For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. You know the biggest argument I see going around 
is I can't prove Christmas from here, so I'll prove Christmas from here in the flesh. Oh, you know, I, my, that child, when you see a child open up the gift for the first time, wow, and that sparkle in their eye. And I have fond memories when I was lost, and we used to celebrate Halloween. And I, I remember I put black on my palms. My grandma, I'd sit there and talk with her, and we'd giggle, and we'd laugh as a little kid. we put black all over my palms, black over my nose, black over my eyes. We put corn oil, we ripped the shirt, I had a lumberjack shirt, ripped the shirt hair, put uh, corn oil here, put corn oil on the back of my hands, put corn oil all over my forehead and all on my face and a little bit on my nose. I think it was just black on my eyes and maybe the lips a little bit. And then, you know, on my nose and the cheeks and the chin and, and neck a little bit. It's like, and then she would take fur and we'd laugh and we'd giggle and we'd talk. And it's just such a joyful time. And she'd cut the fur and she'd put the fur all over my face and she'd put it on right here on my chest and on my hands. And then I'd get my bucket and I would go door to door. You say, what are you talking about? Me. That's what I did for Christmas. My favorite thing to dress up, to, not Christmas, Halloween. My favorite thing to dress up as Halloween was a werewolf that drank blood and eats the flesh with the blood therein. But it was fond memories. See, they start going to this. They can't do it here, so then they start appealing to your flesh. I remember, you know, when the family would come together and we'd all come together and, and we would eat and we'd all laugh and we'd socialism. Do I miss having family get togethers? I do. But if you're going to stand for this in these last days, it's going to mean getting rid of the family get togethers. The satanic music, the satanic holidays, whatever. Family members that uh, I told my daughter, I'll say this right here, I told my daughter, I said, if you want to come visit me, I would love to have you come visit me, but you come here, you dress modestly. There's no cussing. She's starting to get into cussing now. I said, I, don't, I won't put up with it. I don't want cussing around me in this home. I'm not going to tell you what to do in the world because she's now a lady. She's, a, you know, she's 17, about to be turned 18. She's going to be what the state says as a grown adult. I can't force her to do what's right. She's even told me, I quoted scripture to her a couple of times because I was in the mood and I was doing, uh, you know, talking to brethren online, doing scriptures, had learned scriptures. Then she hit me up with something, so I was on her, so then I threw her some scriptures. And I looked back here not thinking, and she comes back, well, I, you need to stop quoting scriptures. I don't like that. You know I don't believe in that. You know, I just, I, said, and I had to tell her, I said, I'm sorry. I was in, this, in a scripture mood, but that is me, and that's who I am, and that's just how I'm going to be. Okay, this is my final authority. But she doesn't accept adhere to it. But the point is, if she's going to come here and visit me and spend some time with her dad, she's got to respect me in my home. If she doesn't, that's just another thing I have to give up for the Lord. Another person that I have to lose in my life to stand for the Lord and His Word. I told her there's no video games here. There's no movies here. There's no satanic style music allowed here. She either respects my home or there's the door. It's tough. It's very tough. But you got people that come in with fair speeches, good words and fair speeches, and say, well, well, when we can't get what we want from here, we'll try to get what we want from here. And they come in with good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. They try to justify a Christian today having one day above another when what was going on back there is you have Jews that have one day above another and they're coming into the Gentiles and telling them that they have to keep that one day above another or they can't be saved or they lose their salvation. That's what's going on here. But you have someone coming around with good words and fair speeches. Oh, this one day? It can be any day. And they try to disguise it as unto the Lord, but when we actually show you, brethren, that the Christmas tree, Christmas lights, Christmas gifts, Christmas dinner, Christmas carols, Christmas wreaths, Christmas stockings, on and on. It's unto man. It's not unto the Lord. How, how would you know? Chapter and verse. And that makes them mad. They get mad every time. Well, how do you know it's not unto the Lord? It's a, because the Lord, if it pleased the Lord, I'm getting ahead of myself again, it'd be in here, brothers and sisters of Christ. It'd be in here. We've got to keep going because we've got a lot to go through. 
Romans chapter 16, verse 7. Turn to Romans chapter 16, verse 17. 16, 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrines which ye have learned, and avoid them. How many times you've heard that called against us? When we say Christmas is bad, it's any they're trading it like in any day, and they are, and it's unto man, and false and it's disguised to get you to worship false gods, and it is, and it has so many practices that elevate the flesh that make you want to celebrate it. Right. Avoid and they'll use that. Avoid them. See the doctrine we have. Romans 14, one man esteemeth one day above another, one man esteemeth every day alike. But we already went through that. It's not any day, it's not in a man, it's not about elevating the flesh. It's about one day that's above another, and that one day is unto the Lord, and it elevates the spirit. And who says that? Who tells us to keep that one day? Who tells us what pleases the Lord and what's unto the Lord? God does. Right? But here we see, contrary to the doctrine which we have learned, for they are that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, elevating the flesh. That's what Christmas is all about. It's not about the birth of Jesus Christ. They disguise all this, trying to say it's about the, the birth of Jesus Christ. But once again, unto the Lord. Is the Lord, present tense, a baby in a manger? No, He isn't. It's all disguised. And we have brethren who approved it, but chapter and verse... Always upsets people. But their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. We read 18, but now when you read 17, you're like, wait a second. Now it's talking about doctrines, which you have learned. Where's the doctrine of Christmas? As a holy day? As a elevating of flood, the flesh day? Being unto man and in any day? Show me. I'll, I'll, uh, if you show me the doctrine of the birth of Jesus Christ as a holy day, because they're making it a holiday, which makes it any day, because they're making any day a holiday today. Holiday is man made. If you show me where the birth of Jesus Christ is not a holiday, but a holy day, I'll repent. A holy day that's supposed to be kept every year. That's what a holy day in the Bible is. It's something you're supposed to do every year. The Jews had to do it every year. Okay? Turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Paul comes in Colossians, and someday we might do an expository study on all of Colossians chapter 2, because it's an amazing chapter, especially for what we're talking about. But for the sake of time, we're going to read just a few parts of it. But Colossians 2, 8, I wonder where. It's one of those I wanted to read. Because one of those memory verses. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the rudiments of the world, I'm sorry, after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Someone comes in over here, rudiments of the world. Christmas, rudiments of the world. Christmas, traditions of men. And we say, it's not after Christ. Well, how do you know it's not after Christ? Chapter and verse. Why are people so disgusted by the Bible all of a sudden when it comes to Christmas? We simply say chapter and verse. That shouldn't make you angry, brother and sister in Christ. That should really motivate you. Well, I need to get into the Scriptures and see what the Scriptures say about the birth of Jesus Christ. And are we supposed to be applying it and perverting it as a holy day and, and perverting it? But, you go down to verse 16. What's he talking about here? Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, or in respect of a holy day, or of a new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Once again, salvation is not based off of those things. The body is of Christ. It's what He did for us, not what we do for Him that saves us. Well, my faith, I, I'm saved by my faith. Then you're saved by something you're doing. You aren't saved by something that God did. That's why the Bible says God's grace, you find it through, great, uh, through faith. Not by faith, but through it. You have to go through it to find God's grace. Okay. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility 
and worshiping of angels. I found that very interesting. What's one of the big pieces that they put on top of the Christmas tree? They either do a five-pointed star, and we're going to get this in another study. Uh, the star wasn't actually above the manger. Okay, The star was uh, going ahead of the wise men, and the star only appeared at Jesus' birth. So the star was in the sky, but where the wise men were, leading them to Jesus Christ. There was no star above the manger. But they'll do a five-pointed star, satanic symbol, or they'll put an angel up there, an idol on an idol. And you'll have Christians say, but, but I don't do that part. It doesn't matter. What's the law of first mention? The Christmas tree, the origins of the Christmas tree. Explain to me why some of the brethren out there who vehemently defend Christmas refuse, refuse to do an actual solid study like Brian did on Halloween. Talk about the origins of, of the Christmas tree. What was put on the Christmas tree originally? They won't do it. Why? Because then they would look like hypocrites. Then they'd look so bad because they'd have to give up the tree. But can't have that. Introducing into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. This is the foundation. Not here. This is what I can fathom, dream up. In other words, if you looked at the angels that are on the top of the trees, the angels that are floating above the nativity scenes, they all have wings and this. And it's like, that's all made up. It's fictitious. It's, it's vain imagination. Angels don't have wings. The fleshly mind, and not holding the head, from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourished the nourishment ministered, and knit together, increasing with the increase of God. Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not, which all are to perish with the using. After the commandments and doctrines of men. We stand here, brother, sister, Christ, and simply say chapter and verse for Christmas. Chapter and verse for building a building, calling it a church, and asking both saved and lost, or inviting both saved and lost to it. Chapter and verse on Sunday best. Chapter and verse on capital T Trinity as a title for God. Chapter and verse on God in three persons, where it says God is in three persons. Chapter and verse where it claims that God the Son, or God the Holy Spirit. There's only one capital G, God the Father. And Jesus is God because He's connected to the Father. He has the soul, God, the Father, in Him. And they are one. I and my Father are one. But we say chapter and verse. And if you can't find it here, guess what it is? The commandments and doctrines of men. If you can't prove to us, those who vehemently stand for Christmas, there's nothing wrong. If you can't prove to us that Christmas is a doctrine and a commandment of God, then it's a doctrine and a commandment of men, and you shouldn't be doing it. Someone once said, when it comes to the Bible, when you say, I'm doing this for the Lord, if it's not in the Bible, you shouldn't be doing it. Where in the Bible are the apostles? I'm getting ahead of myself. Where are the apostles? We're about to get there. Or the apostles are celebrating Christmas. They're not. They are the church. No, Christmas doesn't come. If you see my study, Christmas doesn't, as a holiday for the birth of Jesus Christ, doesn't come on the scenes until between 3 and 400 AD, and it's the Catholic Church that brings it in. Oh, it's about the birth of Jesus Christ. Oh, but by the way, you need to do the Eucharist twice a year Easter, Christmas. Why is it that some of the brethren refuse to do a full-on study of Christmas? The history, its origins, law of first mention. Okay. The commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and, and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. We're supposed to be putting down the flesh. That's what the Holy Spirit comes in and teaches us how to do that. We're not supposed to be elevating the flesh and letting the flesh run rampant. We're not supposed to be basing our commandments and our doctrines off the flesh, off of men unto man. We're supposed to be basing it off of unto the Lord. 
So when we sit here and say chapter and verse, why is that such a hateful thing for the brethren to hear all of a sudden? Chapter and verse. And then like I said, they, they throw up a verse for us. So then we show them the context. It's talking about salvation. It's talking about holy days, Sabbath days. And, they're, and they go from treating it like one day to going back to any day. I can still do any day I want. One day above another. It can be any day. It can be any day. No, it can't. The Bible is our foundation. Chapter and verse. Chapter and verse. I'm going to keep doing it. And it's going to cost me fellowship with some brethren. It already has. I have not, I repeat, I have not broken fellowship with anybody because they celebrate Christmas. But I've had brethren break fellowship with me over Christmas. So they're always pointing it the other way around. We're breaking fellowship with them. And that happens sometimes. But what they won't tell you is they're doing the same thing. The same thing they're angry with and accusing the other brethren of doing. You're breaking fellowship with us because of Christmas. They're breaking fellowship with people because of Christmas. They're doing the same thing. I've never broken fellowship with someone because of Christmas. I just tell them it's a sin, it's wickedness, and you shouldn't be doing it. And every year I'll keep bringing it up. It's a sin, you shouldn't be doing it. You're supposed to be pleasing God, not your flesh. You're supposed to be pleasing God, not your son or daughter, not your wife, not your mother or father, family members, co-workers. You're supposed to be pleasing God. So you ask them, when they come back to this, you ask them, the one day above another, it's talking about holy days, Sabbath days, and the new moon. So you ask them and say, okay, under those three, can you show me in the scripture where the doctrine of Christmas is? Where is the command of Christmas? And once again, some brethren will go, I'll have to look into that. Or that's something I need to pray about and really need to think about, and I need to get back in the scriptures. Praise the Lord. You're not necessarily agreeing with me. But I'm pointing you to this as the final authority. And that part, you're, at least you're listening to. But you get brethren out there, that get, the professing brethren, that get so angry, so bitter, so spiteful, the backbiting, the whisperings, all because I said chapter and verse. Show me the command or the doctrine of Christmas. Can't do it. Where's the doctrine of Christmas? In the New Testament, turn to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. This is going to be a long study, brother, says Christ. Please bear with me. I might break it up into two parts, but there's a lot to go through. Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. Okay, Colossians, where's the doctrine? We just got told that these people are they're worshiping of angels. They're doing things that's based off of the fleshly minds, the flesh. And they're going after the commandments and the doctrines of men in Colossians chapter 2. And it talks about... You know, philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition is men, after the rudiments of the world, and they're pulling you away from Christ. You're no longer have your eyes on Jesus Christ and His Word and living the life of Christ. You're now going back to living like the world. The world as a whole loves the Christmas tree. Why is that? Well, they say, and they say, well, here's I heard this in a comment once. Well, what it is is is. Chris, Christmas used to be Christian. And what you see is, is the Roman Catholic Church in the lost world got a hold of it and they perverted it. And you know what we need to do? We need to take Christmas back. How many of you guys have heard that one? That excuse. They're saying that that one day above another that's unto the Lord that the, uh, the, the, the Christians were doing from the very beginning and it's Christian, it's good. Christmas has always been Christian and good. And we say again, chapter and verse. Let's go through the chapter. Where is the doctrine of Christmas? Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as ye have been taught. Abound ye therein with thanksgiving. Okay, you don't have to turn to these. Be ye followers of me as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 4.16 If a man love me, he will keep my words. We say chapter and verse. John 14.23, that was Jesus speaking. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. John 15.14 Where do we get his commands? Here. You want to be the friend of Jesus? Here's his commands. Not here, not over here, 
here. Oh, uh, oh, we can we can celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ as a holy day, chapter and verse. They don't like it. 1 Corinthians 8, 3, But if a man love me, the same is known of him. In the Old Testament, they had the Levitical laws. They kept the holy days, the feast days. When you had a man in the Old Testament that was right in God's eyes, he was a man that kept the law, the Levitical laws. Psalms 138, verse 2, I will worship towards thy holy temple and praise thy, praise thy name for thy loving kindness, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. Where, and that's what we come back with, and they just, once again, you can tell, brethren, that are falling away from this, when they feel so threatened and get so angry that they start backbiting, they start whispering, they start attacking you personally, they do everything they can to take people's eyes off of this being the final authority. And they throw the biggest fit. Where is the command? If Christmas was always Christian, and the world took it and perverted it, and they do sometimes, they take things from the Bible, and they will pervert them. Almost everything I go back to looking at, all the games, the movie, Hollywood movies, the TV shows, the things that are going on, you can look and they, they take things from this book and they pervert it. They pervert it. So, could they be right? Yes, but they've got to prove it. So we say, okay, prove it. Where was Paul celebrating Christmas and given the commands and the doctrines on Christmas? Halloween, Easter, Pride Day. Where is he given the commands and the doctrines? What about Peter? What about John? What about uh, Barnabas? What about Timothy? How come the writings of the early church before the Catholic Church invented Christmas, why they, they're having nothing to do with the Catholic Church, they're having nothing to do with birthdays, they're having nothing to do with Christmas when it comes out. What's going on? Could it be that that person's promoting a lie? Oh yeah. It's easier to lie than to deal with the truth, isn't it? Christmas is not in the Bible. Christmas was never Christian to begin with. You want me to believe that? You show me chapter and verse where the command and the doctrine is for Christmas. That we're supposed to keep the birth of Jesus Christ as a holy day, throw a lot of fleshly things in there that have nothing to do with the birth of Jesus Christ, and start worshiping a baby Jesus. Show me. I'll repent. Show me. Why is that challenging so hard for people? Because they know it's not in here. The brethren that vehemently stand for this book, or not stand for this book, the, the good thing stand for it. The brethren that vehemently stand for Christmas and knows that this book is against them, they will refuse to do it. To use this book. They get so upset when you say chapter and verse. They'll do everything they can. They'll even go as far as changing the words of God. I don't like that pesty word. I don't like that word decked. I'm going to change it to gilded. How many brethren notice that? Probably shouldn't have said that, but how many brethren notice that? Why is it when we say chapter and verse on Trinity, post or mid-trib, or work-based salvation, other pagan holidays like Halloween and Easter, we get an amen from most of the brethren? When we say chapter and verse on something that they don't have a problem with and don't struggle with and they believe is bad and wrong, then we get an amen. But when it comes to Christmas, they have the attitude of, how dare you say chapter and verse? Are you saying I'm going to go to hell? Are you saying that I'm not saved? Are you saying I'm going to lose my salvation? See how they always do that? They run to stuff like this. They run to liberty issues where liberty issues have to do with salvation issues. They run to Romans 14, 5, trying to hide behind it when it's talking about a salvation issue. 
People were being judged. Their salvation was being judged. I'm judging your sin. And what gets me is the lost, easy believism. That's how they act. You hit them up with their sin. Okay, you claim to be a, a brother in Christ. You claim to be a sister in Christ. You claim to be saved. You know that thing you're doing right there? That's very sinful and wicked. And they come back with, I'm not saved by works. I'm not saved by works. You're acting like them. Stop acting like the lost world and get back to your first love, the Word of God. Start, start acting like the Christian you, Christian you know you are, if you are. Stop getting back to your first love and acting right and being separate from this world. Stop acting like this world. Philippians 3.16. Turn to Philippians 3.16. Once again, they get mad at us when we say, where's Paul doing this? Where's Peter doing this? If it's one day above another and it's unto the Lord and it can be any day, unto, and it's supposed to be unto the Lord, we point out how it's unto man and they don't like it. And it's about the flesh. It's about you, me, myself, and I. It's not about the Lord. It's not about elevating the Spirit, pleasing God. Philippians 3.16 Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us mind the same things. Brethren, be, be followers together of me, and mark them which you walk, so as you have us for an example. So why do you get mad when we ask, well, where is Paul doing this? He set the example. Where is Paul doing this? Oh, we don't care anymore. Our standards change when it comes to Christmas. And that's exactly what's going on, brethren. You need to check yourselves. Your standards are changing because of Christmas. Verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Rudiments of the world, traditions of men. Now, brothers and sisters Christ, when you hear me say a Christian hymn for destruction, I'm not talking about losing salvation. This is talking about false converts coming in and messing people up. Paul said, where are we doing that? Some false Christians come in and say, hey, I know we, we, it's a new movement called the Catholic Church, Catholicism, but I'm one of you. And they start bringing in all this junk. And Paul, I know Paul wasn't there, but I'm just using this example. And it's like, we go, where was Paul doing this stuff? Where's Paul doing this stuff? He's not doing it. You're fake and you're, and you're false. Okay? But when I talk about a Christian hymn for destruction, I'm talking about the flesh. The Bible says, if you live by the flesh, ye shall die. But if you through the Spirit, capital S Spirit, elevating the Holy Spirit in your life, through the Spirit, do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. If you live by the flesh, ye shall die. If you see a Christian that's getting into sin, getting in the ways of the world, they're heading for destruction. I'm talking about physical destruction. You're hurting your walk with the Lord, that spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God. You're missing out on rewards. There's a lot of reasons why we're trying to help you. You're heading for destruction. But we see there, let us walk the same rule. Christians that believe that Christmas is a sin are offended by it. And I am. I'm offended by that Christmas tree. It's pagan. It's wicked. That The stuff they put on top of it, the stuff that they put on it, the gift offerings that they put underneath, and realizing that was all about me, myself and I. All the practices, it's about elevating the flesh, it's about pleasing me, or pleasing someone else around me. It wasn't about pleasing God. Okay? So you have them, and then you have on this side versus Christians that believe that Christmas is okay and they need it like a drug. And that's what I'm getting. They need it like a drug. It's not just Christmas, that whole big thing about social gatherings and everything. One of the biggest things I missed once I gave up the Bible buildings and got truly saved and said, I'm going to do things God's way, one of the biggest pulls trying to pull me back was I missed the social gatherings. I miss the hanging out and going camping and, and having fun and this and that. The social gathering. Satan will use whatever he can to pull you away from the Lord. He can't prevent you from getting saved. You get saved, all he can do is come in and mess you up. Sift you like wheat. 
And the number one person he likes to sift like wheat, like he did Peter, which was trying to do Peter, is men that God has called in ministry. He really likes to sift them like wheat. Okay? And then, so you have two groups on two opposite sides. One's disgusted by Christmas. It's, it's, if you've ever done the study on Christmas, you would be disgusted too. The history, the origins of Christmas. You, as a Bible-believing, God-fearing man, truly saved, born again with the Holy Spirit in you, you would be disgusted by Christmas too. You would. Versus those that are okay with it. How is that us walking by the same rule? If we come, if someone comes along and says, I got a solution, we'll just agree to disagree. How is that walking by the same rule? Let us mine the same, how is us mining the same things? It's not. Okay? That whole teaching of agreeing to disagree when it comes to biblical matters, there's a difference between agreeing to disagree uh, when we talk about favorite colors, favorite foods, favorite trees, favorite animals. I'm sorry, I'll have to agree to disagree. My favorite animal is such and such. That's different. It's worldly things than this, saying that it's okay to di agree to disagree on this. It isn't. Okay? There are certain things in here where I say the Bible doesn't teach this, but I think this. And you come along going, well, well I believe that it's going to happen this way. A good example, 24 elders. Brian thinks the 24 elders is two from each of the 12, uh, each of the 12 boundaries of the Gentile side. I believe it's one from each of all 24 boundaries because there's actually 24 boundaries, not 12. There's 24 total boundaries. 12 on the Gentile, 12 on the Jew. Makes 24. We can agree to disagree. It's one of those things where we're not even agreeing to disagree. I mean, Brian kind of changed and tries to make it out like, if you can't see this, then you're blind. But he used to be like, this is just my theory. And like me, that's just my theory. Could I be wrong when we get to heaven? Yeah. Could he be wrong when we get to heaven? Yeah. When will we find out who those 24 elders are? When we get to heaven. So it's still not something we're agreeing to disagree on. Neither one of us has foundation to say it's guaranteed these people. There are some things that have to do with the future that we sit there and go, I don't know. I don't know. And we're honest about it. We need to be honest about it instead of prideful about it. Um, I don't know. But when it comes to your walk with the Lord and it comes to this book and the commandments of God and the doctrines of God, we're supposed to be on the same page. There is no agreeing to disagree. And their whole point about agreeing to disagree is you do your thing over there and I'll do my thing over here. You might not like Christmas, so I'll do Christmas over here and you can stay over there and not do Christmas. Does that bring the body of Christ together? Or does that separate us? And I don't know, I know I have some brethren that watch her from other countries, but here in America, they had that same attitude that we can agree to disagree with sodomy. In America, we had sodomite laws. There were states that had sodomite laws. Sodomy is illegal. Sodomy is illegal. Then someone comes along and says, we need to make sodomy okay in the sense that they can just do what they want. They can do it over there, and we can, we can do our thing over here, and we can just all get along by agreeing to disagree. We can all get along. How does that work out here in America? Sodomy went from being illegal, because it's an abomination, to now they're going after our children. Why? Because there is no such thing as agree to disagree. You let, a, The Bible talks about a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. There is no we can agree to disagree on Christmas. Christmas is wicked. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And I see it happening. I see it happening. It's destroying the body of Christ. Because this is no longer becoming the final authority. It's pulling this, Christmas pulls this away from you and gets you, this is the final authority. This brings brethren together. This flesh tears them apart. Jeremiah 6.16 says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. You shall find rest for your souls. That's why we go back to Paul and them. Okay? Where's Paul doing this? Where's Peter doing it? Barnabas. I mean, there's got to be at least one of them doing it, right? How come 
None of them are doing it. But this is Christian. This is Christian. Okay. This is Christian. And, but they said, we will not walk therein. Once again, where is the apostles' early church celebrating Jesus' birth as a holy day called Christmas? I'll repent if you can show me in the scriptures. Show me Christmas in the scriptures. We will not walk therein. People that cannot stand chapter and verse when their flesh starts going the way of the world. People just can't handle it. They cannot handle chapter and verse. They become Pharisees. They become um, scribes. What are the Pharisees? They hold the traditions of men above the word of God. They'll quote the law to you, the law, the Levitical laws. Holy days, Sabbath days. Oh, you're profaning the Sabbath day. How many times do they try to get on to Jesus for profaning the, profaning the Sabbath day? He's one that created the Sabbath day. Where did he create Christmas? I'm going to keep riding this home. Okay, and you got scribes. I've noticed with some of the brethren that to try to vehemently make videos to defend Christmas, they start changing the word of God into a lie. That's what the scribes do. They start acting like the scribes. They start acting like Pharisees. They start acting like the lost world with their arguments and appealing to the flesh and feelings and opinions to get you to celebrate Christmas. Or at least be okay with that person celebrating Christmas. But the scribes are the ones that says a better rendering would be, Yea, hath God said. God chose the word decked, but I'm going to change it to gilded. God said that workmen with the axe, the axe, that's what the workman is, I'm going to change it to craftsman. So, like I said, brothers and sisters of Christ, I don't know how else to drive this home. If you show us that vehemently defend Christmas, if you show us Christmas in the Bible as a commandment of God and as a doctrine of God, I'll repent. I'll come out and publicly repent. If you can show me the command to keep the birth of Jesus Christ as a holy day, and part of keeping the birth of Jesus Christ as a holy day, you have to have a Christmas tree. You have to have Christmas lights. You have to have Christmas gifts. You have to have Christmas dinner. You have to have Christmas stockings, Christmas wreaths, a fat guy coming down the chimney. Show me all of its, all of its Santa Claus. You're a hypocrite if you say, I don't, I don't celebrate the Santa Claus side, and yet you put up a Christmas tree. You're a hypocrite. It's all Santa Claus. Chapter and verse where there's a Christmas tree in the birth of Jesus Christ. They just can't handle it. Why? Because they've forgotten their first love, which is the Scriptures. We'll be doing a Bible study on the birth of Jesus Christ here shortly. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Please turn to Romans chapter 14, verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? We already talked about the verse before this. He goes back to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It goes back to salvation. So what's the judgment here? You're judging a brother to have lost his salvation. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou not set that not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give an account of himself to God. Jesus is the one who saves, and that person's life of a Christian, they have to give an account of himself to God. But once again, we know the judgment here is talking about salvation. How come? Because we're allowed to judge against sin. Paul judges against sin. First of all, Acts chapter 10, verse 34, you don't have to turn there, but then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of the truth I perceive that God is not a respecter of persons. He's not a respecter of persons. If you're trying to keep the holy days and the Sabbath days and the new moon to say, Look at me, I'm holier than thou, God's not a respecter of persons. God looks at the heart. Now I put it on my nose and said, do you think God will have more respect for those who keep the holy days, Sabbath days, and new moon over, over a Christian that's not doing that, but they're out there witnessing for Jesus Christ, being ambassador for Jesus Christ? 
giving out those gospel tracts, laying those gospel tracts. He's reading his Bible every day. He's reading his Bible every day. He's studying his Bible every day. He's praying every day. He's giving God thanks in all things. He's giving God glory in all things. He's singing hymns. But because he's not keeping the one day above another, God's going to have more respect for this one guy that keeps one day above another, but doesn't read his Bible every day. All that stuff, is, it's good and everything, but it's not as important. God's not a respecter of persons. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12, we read, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, and I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? See, one of the biggest distractions they'll try to give with this whole thing, I'm trying to go to the Scriptures. This is what I'm fighting for, brothers and sisters in Christ, and this is what I'm trying to get you to fight for. The Word of God. And you'll have people that come around and say, well, it's no longer a fight about standing for the Word of God, it's about Brother Philip versus Brother Brian. Or Brother Philip versus so-and-so. Or this so-and-so versus Brother Brian. And it's... And that's what they try to do to distract you. No, it's about Jesus Christ. It's about His perfect written word. This is what you fight for. Don't fall for that. Don't fall for that, brothers and sisters of Christ. This is the final authority. Like I said, I got into somebody, and I, no matter how hard I tried to point him to this and tried to get him to talk to me about the word of God as it applied to Christmas, he would not do it. He wouldn't do it. And in the end, he says, I don't care what you... And I quote scripture, and at the end, he says, I don't care what you say, I'm never going to change my mind. I gave him a thumbs up. Then go your way. You're going a path that I can't go. Go your way. Why is it they don't want to discuss the Word of God when it comes to Christmas? They don't want to discuss it. put on here, you can sit there and blame me or anyone else for the bad choices you made. But when you sit there at the judgment seat of Christ, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. We're going to read this. When you stand before Jesus Christ at the judgment seat of Christ, there is no saying, Brian said I couldn't do this. Or Brian said I could do this. So-and-so said it was okay. Tim at ABB TV said, it's okay for me to play video games. He told me it was okay. We could play some video games and Hollywood movies and TV shows and anime and satanic style music. He told me it was okay. This other man, he told me that the Babel buildings were good and it was a great thing. He told me it was okay, Lord. It's not my fault. Yes, it is. But why? Because God gave you instructions and you didn't follow them. He gave you His Word, and you didn't follow Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. And I know this seems like it's, you're really coming down, judgment. I'm preaching the Word to you and trying to get you to wake up. This is the final authority. Not me. Not anybody else out there. Okay? Not your flesh. Elevating your flesh. The Word of God is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. We are confident... And I say I'm willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. How many of us want to go home? I've talked with the Lord since today the day to come home. Okay. My life is not my own. There's times in my life that I, when I was newly saved that I had made such a wreck of my life I wanted to die. You know, the depression that leads to suicide. But do you know why I never committed suicide? Because my life is not my own. I look up to the Lord and say, my life is not mine, it's yours. But Lord, I really, really want to be with you. I've made such a mess of things down here. And I have. When I was newly saved, I fought the Lord a lot. <laughs> okay? And some of the other brethren out there have testimonies of the same thing. They fought the Lord. My advice, don't fight the Lord. Get into this book. And when He tells you to do something, do it. Trust Him. Be patient. Okay? Sometimes it's not us that's making a mess of things. Sometimes the world's just becoming a mess. Look at today. The world's a huge mess. Right? There's times where I look at this world and how bad it is today, and I just long to go home. I try to preach the gospel. Nobody wants the gospel. I try to hand out gospel tracts. Oh, that's nice. And they wind up throwing it away. But I'm still going to hand out gospel tracts. I'm still going to try to preach the word. 
the, the gospel, but nobody really wants it today. Brother, uh, uh, brethren, I asked the Lord, I said, look, Lord, look at the body of Christ. Look at the condition of the body of Christ. Look how many people have fallen away. Look how small of number we are. I mean, it's just, Lord, can I come home? The attitude of a Christian when they get saved is Paul's like, I want to go be with the Lord. This is hard. <laughs> Living for the Lord every day down here, it's hard. I want to go live. He's not using it as an escape. But, and we're not supposed to use it. Like I said, when I made a mess of things, I looked to the Lord. He picked me back up and put me back together. But the reason that if I was lost, I'm telling you right now, if I was lost and made some of the mistakes that I made, I don't know what would have happened. If I wasn't saved and had the Lord Jesus Christ right here to pick me back up and carry me. Remember footsteps. The poem Footsteps. They got it wrong. They say there's two sets of footprints and then one set of footprints and then two sets of footprints. And that one set of footprints is when the hard, that's when the hardest times happened. How come you left me, Lord? And the footprints, it's like, no, that's when I carried you. And if you actually stop and look at your life as a Christian, that's wrong. There should be one set of footprints, and during the hard times, there was two sets of footprints, and then the one set of footprints. God is always carrying us. I can't, make one day, I can't go one day without the Lord Jesus Christ, without the Holy Spirit. And when times get really rough, and I start making a mess of things, it's because I told Jesus, don't carry me, I got this. Don't carry me, I got this. And the reason there's two footprints is because Jesus never left us. He's still there. Walking with us. But God carries us every day. But brethren, we desire to go home. We all do. Wherefore we labor that with whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. But we're here for a reason. But it's more needful for me to be here, Paul says. To help the brethren, to encourage the brethren, to get encouragement from the brethren. Amen. To teach, to preach, to call out sin, to call out false converts, wolves in sheep's clothing, protect the flock. It's much needful for me to be here, Paul was saying. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. If we just went straight up the moment we got saved, we wouldn't have any rewards, except the crown reward of life, salvation. But what about the other rewards? That's why we're still here. Done in his body according to things that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your consciences. You really have to kill your conscience to really, really justify Christmas as a Bible thing. As a unto the Lord thing. You really got to, um, what is it called? Uh, quenching the Holy Spirit. Killing your conscience weakening it so you don't have to listen to it, you don't have to listen to the Holy Spirit, and you continue doing it. It was manifest in your conscience. For we commend not ourselves again unto you, but give you occasion to glory on our behalf, that you may have somewhat to answer to them, which glory in appearance and in heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Once again, to get this really to cut, really to go home. So I got one more page to get this to really to go home, brothers and sisters in Christ. The judgment that's going on here in, in Romans 14 for that one day. The judgment is not that oh you're not supposed to judge it as a sin. No, if it's sin according to the Bible, false god worship, elevating the flesh and feeding the flesh and putting the spirit down, and the pagan practices. Okay. Sun God worship, the Eucharist, that's what uh, Christmas was originally designed for. To get Christians to start worshiping the Roman pagan God, and they tried to ma mask it as if it's Christian. It was never Christian. We're not, this isn't saying we can't justify sin. It's not saying we can't, ju uh, we can't, I'm sorry, just, we can't judge sin. It's not, this judgment that's going on here is not judging sin. This judgment that's going on here is not judging whether you're a false convert or not. Because Paul tells us where to judge false converts. We are to judge sin. Okay? The judgment here is that you cannot get saved. What does that sound like? Calvinism. 
You cannot get saved if you don't do this. Or you can lose your salvation. In other words, if you don't die in a state of grace and do enough good works, what does that sound like? It's not judging sin. It's not talking about judging false converts. We're allowed to do that. So when I point out that Christmas is sinful and I show you how Christmas is sinful in my Christmas studies, I'm calling out sin. I'm allowed to and I'm commanded to. Deal with it. I don't like it. I don't like it. Then you're going down a path that I can't follow. You need to be following this. And where I'm not following this, correct me. But do it through Scripture. But a lot of these people that vehemently defend Christmas, they're parroting what they heard some other preacher say, well, Romans 14.5, Romans 14.5, and they're not doing the study for themselves. They're not studying the Second Timothy 2.15. They're not studying to show themselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. They're not doing that. They're, they're hoping somebody else does it for them. I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. I'm of Brian. I'm of Philip. I'm of Brad Avenshine. I'm of uh, Brother JT, Jacob Thomas, the wine press. I'm of this person. Because they don't want to do the work themselves. No, you're supposed to study the Word of God for yourself. You're supposed to take what someone says and teaches and, and check the Scriptures day, night and day to see if those things are so. Okay? Gentile days are unto false gods. They are pagan. Let's get back to this. Okay? One day above another. And it's supposed to be unto the Lord. He's saying this to the, Gent uh, to the Gentiles. But think about it. Another way to look at this is all the Gentiles have is pagan days. They don't have any days unto the Lord. It's all pagan. So where do they get days unto the Lord? From the Jews. But Gentile days, Pharaoh's birthday, Genesis 4, 40 to 20. You got a man who, who wants to be worshipped as God, and he has a birthday. Nobody else does, he does. Herod, he celebrates Easter, Acts chapter 12, verse 4. His birthday is in Matthew chapter 14, 6. You say, ah, ha, ha, but he wasn't worshipped as a God, you know. No, then you, you're ignorant of Scripture. Okay, he's worshipped as a God in Acts 12, 22. And God kills him for not giving him the glory. He let the people give Herod the glory and worship him as a God. You see why some people are really against his birthdays? Oh, yeah. Mark 8, 15, we read, and he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the leaven of Herod. Galatians 5, 9 says, A little leaven leaveth the whole lump. What's going on in Galatians? They're trying to... The, the leaven of the Pharisees, they're trying to bring you back under the law. And sometimes their traditions of men, that's what this is over here, some of the stuff that they're trying to get you back under isn't even under the law. It's their own traditions of men. What about the leaven of Herod? Herod was a pagan, taking pagan things, which is what the Catholic Church has done. Catholicism is just pagan Rome. Heathen things and bringing them in and saying, okay, now we're going to try to put a Jesus stamp on it and make it okay. Herod was a pagan. Beware of the leaven of Herod. Of Herod. Right. So what groups of people had days unto the Lord? I just want to read a few things. Turn to Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Who had days unto the Lord? What was going on that Paul had to tell Romans, the Gentiles, well, if you, one man esteemeth one day above another, he's talking about the Jews. One man esteemeth every day alike, he's talking about the Gentiles. As far as it applied to what the Jews were trying to push them on. We don't celebrate those. We don't do those holy days. We don't do those Sabbath days. What are those days? We even know where you go. He's talking to the Gentiles. The days that they did keep were all any day unto man and unto the flesh. So when he's bringing this up, what's going on? Why don't we compare Scripture with Scripture? Acts 15.1 and, and certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, Ye cannot be saved. Now, the reason I underline that, you say, well, that's circumcision. That's not one day. They went back to Moses. 
If you jump down to verse 10, it says, Now therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the necks of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? It's not just a circumcision that's being taught here. It's just the one that they singled out. After the manner of Moses, they're trying to bring him back under the Levitical laws in order to be saved. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Once again, salvation comes in. They're coming in and bringing in Levitical laws and saying you have to keep the Levitical laws, the one day above another, to the Gentiles. That's what's going on here. And Paul's like, uh, whether someone holds one day above another, talking about the Jews, or every day alike, the Gentiles, concerning what the Jews were saying when it comes to salvation, because in the Old Testament it was salvation. You needed to keep the Levitical laws or you were cut off or killed. But today, that's not salvation. It was. But that's not salvation today. We have salvation through Jesus Christ. Not the law. Okay? After the manner of Moses, when Moses came along, when Moses came along with the law, it was works to be saved. Why didn't they say, after the manner of Abraham? That's when circumcision came in, is that Abraham? But when was it made a law? It was a covenant. Then it became a law when Moses came through. So it's talking about the laws. You've got the Jews coming in trying to get brethren to keep the law in order to be saved. Galatians chapter 2. But neither Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised and because of and that because of false brethren others wares brought in who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. What's that bondage? That you have to keep the old Levitical laws in order to be saved. You've got to keep that holy day and that Sabbath day and the new moon in order to be saved. Bondage. Okay? The Old Testament saints weren't, uh, weren't sealed into the day of redemption. They were in bondage to the flesh. They were, the soul was connected to the flesh, and they had to observe the Levitical laws. They had to do animal sacrifices to, uh, to cover their sins. It took Jesus' blood to wash their sins away, too. Verse 5, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. So we see again, brethren, false brethren unawares. I believe it's talking about the Jews. Or it could be talking about Gentiles that were perverted by Jews, saying you have to keep the laws. You've got to be circumcised. You know someone who's deceiving and being deceived? But they're false brethren. That's how we can tell you can still judge false brethren. This isn't saying you can't judge false brethren. Yes, it is. yes you can. It's saying you can't tell somebody that if they don't get circumcised, what do we read right there? Up in Acts chapter 15, verse 1, you cannot be saved if you don't get circumcised. If you don't get circumcised, you cannot be saved. If you don't keep these holy days, you've lost your salvation. You got circumcised and you're saved, but you failed to keep these holy days, you just lost your salvation. You see how it's going, what's going on here? See how it's working? Uh, Galatians chapter 5, or might bring us into bondage, verse 5. To whom we gave place of objection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. The truth of the gospel, Jesus saves. You can't save yourself. Galatians 5, 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be, be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ profiteth you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. He's talking mainly to the Jews. If you think that circumcision today is going to save you, then you're a debt to the whole law. If you believe works can save you, you're going to wind up standing before Jesus Christ at the great white throne, and you're going to find out that you're, you're going to be a debtor to the whole law. You might have obeyed these laws over I'm sorry. You might have obeyed these laws over here, but you broke these over here. You break one of them, you go to hell. You get tossed in the lake of fire for all eternity. You're going to be held accountable to the whole law. Christ has become of none effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. 
We have that spiritual circumcision today, brothers and sisters Christ. That's what this is talking about. Don't judge their salvation. Today we've got that spiritual circumcision. The Old Testament law, if you did not keep the holy days, Sabbath days, new moon, you were cut off from Israel. Today would be the same thing as saying you lost your salvation. You're cut off from Israel. Sometimes you get stoned to death. For, for, for profaning the Sabbath day, holy days. But a lot of times you were cut off. That's where we get the Samaritans. I believe they're Jews that were cut off. They can't be called Jews anymore. By blood, but spiritually, they've lost that inheritance. They've been cut off from their people. And they might be what they, they're as good as dead to the Jewish people. They're as good as dead. I'd rather deal with a Gentile dog than a Samaritan. Be a debtor to the whole law. Turn to Acts chapter 10, verse 22. Okay. Here's a situation I want to bring up where you have a Gentile that's trying to honor the Jewish people and trying to live right when the Jews say this is the right way to live. I'm not saying he was 100% Jew and all aspects as far as circumcision and everything. It doesn't say that. But it did say that the Jews said this is a good man and that he feareth God. Acts 10, 22. And they said, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God, and of good report among all the nations of the Jews, was warned from God by a holy angel to send for thee into his house and to hear his words of thee. Remember, Peter has the dream. The tent comes down. All these animals, you know, this is unclean, Lord. I can't touch this. I can't eat it. I can't touch it. I've never done anything unclean. And he said, what I've made... But I've made clean, called out thou common. And as soon as he gets out of that vision, he gets a knock at the door. I need you to go preach to the Gentiles, the gospel to the Gentiles. But look at this man. He's a just man and one that feareth God and have a good report among all the nations of the Jews. Jump down to verse 20. Acts chapter 10, verse 30. I'm sorry, jump down to 30. Acts 10, 30. And Cornelius said, Four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house. And behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, thy prayer is heard, and thy arms are had, had in remembrance in the sight of God. Remember what Psalm 16, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So you have a Gentile, Cornelius the centurion, that is a pra I say kind of like a practicing Jew. Not in every aspect, but enough for God to say that, hey, your prayer is heard. Okay, you're a just man, one that feareth God, and a good report among the nation of Israel. Remember, before Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, salvation was of the Jews. God's not done with the Jewish people. So what's happening right now is the Jews, the Bible talks about they're, they're blind in part. This is the time of the Gentiles. So when you got brethren out there that are really trying to grab this verse, Romans 14, 5, and trying to slam it under here, and trying to say we can make it any day we want, any kind of a heathen day we want, put a rubber Jesus stamp on it, that's not what the Bible's teaching. The Bible's showing that, hey, somebody's coming into these Gentiles and tell them that there's certain days that they have to keep in order to be saved. And the ones getting persecuted are the ones that won't keep that one day. And Paul has to set things straight. He has to set things straight time and time and time again. Jesus Christ saves. It is finished. Going back under the Levitical laws and the Old Testament laws and ordinances, they're not going to save you. If you keep one of them, you're a debtor to all of them. All of them. Mm -hmm. and then we get to Romans 14, 13. We'll, we'll finish this one real quick. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Okay? What greater way to get a Christian to stumble and go out of the way than to get them to doubt their salvation? What better control can 
one have over people if you play God, dang, lowercase g God, dangling salvation on a stick. You know, have you ever heard of carrot and a stick? Put a carrot on a stick and get them, okay, I want you to do this. Well, the Bible doesn't say to do it. Ooh, your salvation. Uh oh, your salvation. Look at this. Look at this. If you don't come over here and do what I tell you to do, you see what's going on? That's what's going on here in Romans 14. That's what's going on. But judge this, that you put no stumbling block in front of your brethren. You don't cause your brethren to fall. You don't cause your brethren to go off feelings and opinions and to turn on the book. My, my job is to point you to the Word of God and to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. And if I see that someone's coming along a wolf in sheep's clothing, a brother in Christ is starting to stumble, whatever, I'm supposed to tell you, hey, you need to get back to this. That person, they're wrong. If it's a brother in Christ, they're wrong. If it's a wolf in sheep's clothing, hey, that person's a wolf in sheep's clothing. Stay away from them. Okay, protect the flock. But if you're part of the group that's causing people to stumble, had someone trying to be a pastor that was preaching that video games are okay. Certain video games are okay. Hollywood movies are okay. TV shows are okay. Anime is okay. Satanic style music. So he was putting a stumbling block in front of the brethren. Causing brethren to stumble. I gave that stuff up for the Lord, and you're trying to get me back into it. Christmas comes around. Holidays come around. I gave them up for the Lord, and here comes somebody along trying to get me to get back into it. How many of you brothers and sisters in Christ gave up Christmas and then fell back into it, gave it up, fell back into it, because one man would tell you it's okay, another man would tell you it's false. And they had good stories. I'm talking about the ones that tell you it's okay. They have a really good story. and They make a really good point. I want to get back into Christmas. And then you come across a man that says, hey, chapter and verse, but don't forget, this is the Word of God. This is supposed to be your foundation on matters of faith and practice. And you get convicted because you have the Holy Spirit in you and you give it up. How many of you have stumbled and fallen because somebody out there started teaching that something that the Bible says is not okay is now okay in this situation or this circumstance. How many of you? I'll raise my hand. Those people are going to have to answer at the judgment seat of Christ for what they do, putting a stumbling block in front of the brethren. They're going to have to answer for it. I'm going to have to answer for it. If I put stumbling blocks in front of the brethren, they are going to have to answer for it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Romans chapter 14, verse 5. I would hit him up with pagan holidays and ask him, is that one day that you're reading any day? And I would tell him, what about verse 6? It says, unto the Lord. And anytime we're doing something unto the Lord, God will tell us how to do it. Can you show me chapter and verse? You won't get everything we talked about. I don't think you'll ever get the ones that are hardcore Christmas. I want Christmas. I want Christmas. And they're sacrificing the brethren on the altar of Christmas. You won't get as far as this. I know it's a long study. Please, I apologize. I hope you could stay with me with your Bibles open and following along. The whole point is to find out who the one day is, who determines what the one day is. And the brethren in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, they set the example and say, hey, you're supposed to follow my example. Where are they? Celebrating all this over here. Christmas. Where are they doing it? That was the whole point of this. That this is our final authority. And that this is talking about judging salvation when it comes to the Levitical laws. So they come to you with Romans 14.5, say, what about six? And it's one day, any day. If one day isn't any day, it's only certain days, one day, then God's the one that needs to, needs to and will tell us what days we need to keep. And remember, the life of a Christian, every day is unto the Lord. Every day. So, I've got to wrap this up. It's been long. I apologize, Brother and Sister Christ, for how long it is. It's getting cold in here again. <laughs> um, so please pray for me, for the heater. That the heater comes, it'll work, at least for this winter, and get me through this winter. But I want to say this, Brother and Sister Christ, I say this out of love. I say this out of love. This isn't me attacking you. I'm not judging salvation. But I'm telling you the truth. You're heading for destruction. Physical destruction. 
The, the kingdom of God cannot inherit the kingdom of God. We talked about in another study where if you start getting into sin and the ways of the world, it's going to hinder you being a, your, your fellowship with the Lord because that's what the kingdom of God is. It's spiritual. That's going to hinder your walk with the Lord. You're heading for destruction. You're heading for destruction. Either the flesh is going to be destroyed, God kills you and brings you home early, or you're heading for God's chastening, which is still, you know, the, by the terror of the Lord we persuade men. It is not, it's supposed to be a fearful thing when God is chastising or standing before God at the judgment seat of Christ and realizing, I did a lot of bad things that I tried to disguise as Christianity. I put a lot of stumbling blocks in front of the brethren because I wanted what I wanted instead of wanting what God wanted. And I know people are going to put me down, make fun of me, attack me personally, the backbiting, the whisperings. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this is our final authority. When they do finally quote scripture to you, when you say chapter and verse, keep them in the scriptures. They, sometimes, the thing about this, real quick, is they'll quote Romans 14.5 thinking, I'm done quoting scripture, that's good enough, shut up and stay away from me. But then you got to be like, no, 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 we still need to get through, we need to get to verse 6. We still need to talk about what the one day is, what it means to be unto the Lord, who tells us what's unto the Lord, what pleases the Lord, who gives us the commands and doctrines, who sets an example, Paul sets an example, Peter sets an example, where are they doing this that you're trying to justify? You keep them in the Word of God. And you'll find it real quick if they have a love of the Word of God. If they, if they just try to quote this and that's it, I'm gone. And that's why I've seen people that they quote that, and I say, what about six? And they come back with personal attacks and yelling at me, and, rrr, rrr, rrr. and I'm like, all I said was verse six. We're trying to have a fellowship and talk about the Word of God. Why are you getting upset? Because they don't want to go through the Scriptures. They were hoping by saying, Romans 14, 5, would get me to shut up. Misusing it, taking it out of context, would get me to shut up. No, we need to keep talking. We need to keep going through the scriptures. So, brethren, uh, be careful. Okay, we're going through this month. I got some more studies on Christmas to do, but I'm throwing in some extra studies here and there that have nothing to do with Christmas, and that we can learn instruction, righteousness, and we can stay in the Word of God as a whole, and we're not being distracted by this pagan holiday. Okay. So, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for your patience, and thank you, thank you for your prayers. Right. And I'll see you in the next video.